Hello, and welcome to Getting It Done, a podcast about music, education, and life lessons. I'm your host, Tim Rausenberger, and today is a rebroadcast of episode 161, our first interview on the podcast with filmmaker Kyle Dubiel, which took place on Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. Episode 271, which will be aired on Thursday, April 25th, 2019, will be a live podcast with Kyle in studio with me. And I cannot wait to ask him about all the exciting things that have transpired in the past year and a half since this original broadcast you are about to hear. Sit back and enjoy the remarkable life of Kyle Dubiel as he talks to you about all things relating to filmmaking, video, and photography. Hello, this is Tim Rausenberger with BrassTenor.com. Today is Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. This is episode 161. Interview number one, Kyle Dubiel. Well, after 160 episodes, we finally have our first Q&A interview with one of my top students of all time, Kyle Dubiel. Uh, I've known Kyle now for, oh my goodness, how long have we known each other for? Uh, like uh, nine, 11? No, 11 years? 11 years. 11 yeah. years, yeah, I guess. Known each other for 11 years. I actually started teaching Kyle when he was nine, nine years old in the fourth grade, and uh, he is now 20 soon to be the big 21 yeah. and uh, he is well he's gonna kind of tell you about himself uh, what I will tell you just a little bit about him um, one of the reasons why he's my first interview is he is absolutely uh, a person that you if you want to model someone he's the person that you want to emulate because he's the type of human being who doesn't give up, uh, doesn't accept failure. Um, he's all about, you know, reaching and trying to, to, to not just crack, but shatter the breath, the, uh, the glass ceiling. And, uh, so I, I'm going to just turn it over to Kyle and, uh, I'd like, if you can just kind of share with everyone and tell them a little bit about yourself, I guess, you know, taking us through the time that we first met all the way up to where you are now present day, and then we can talk a little bit about what you're doing with your life now. All right. Well, first, thank you for the kind words, and uh, thank you for having me on this podcast as your first interview. It's an honor. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the story begins when I was in fourth grade, and uh, I um, we had to sign up for our instruments. And I originally wanted to do drums, but uh, I was afraid of the um, audition we had to do for the drums. And so, because the, inf of, the infamous rhythm audition, yes, which I put all my drummers through, so you were scared of it. Okay, I was scared, and that's the reason why I did not do dr the drums, and I put down trumpet. Um, and I don't know why I put down trumpet, but I just did, and I thought it was a cool instrument um, to learn how to play. And I put it down, and then we started. I was in trumpet group T3. It was, <laughs> wow, uh, what a memory, wow. It was terrible, and the kids in there, I mean, like, between just, like, sucking, a ma like, mouthpieces and, uh, like, licking mouthpieces are way too much. <laughs> like, it was an interesting group, uh, a, a class of clowns, I guess you could say. Um, me, uh, definitely a clown-like, very clown-like in the class. Uh, you know, every lesson, I was not very good at trumpet. I was in T3 out of four, which I guess, you know, I made it to T3, but, you know, 
I'm pretty sure that's because Ford didn't even know where the mouthpiece was. I have to ask you this, because this is interesting. I, all the years that I've now since spoken to students about having them in school, first of all, I, don't, I can't even recall any student ever remembering the exact group they were in, but did this, was, were you fully conscious and fully aware at age nine that you were in group T3 and not in T1 or T2? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I don't think anybody else did. I mean, okay. I was just, I guess, I mean, I, think, I just got it. And I was like, well, all right. Did I at least do you alphabetically so you felt better because your last name began with a D or was that bad too? Were you like on the bottom? Uh, I don't remember. Okay, good. <laughs> I feel uh, a little better now. I don't remember that. But no, but I mean, looking back, I'm sure at the time I didn't really care, but I did notice that like the first trumpets were in T1 and the second trumpets were in T2 and the third trumpets were in T3. However, I'll never forget the day that we were in band and you actually gave me the first trumpet part. Mm -hmm. Or a second trumpet part, and mm -hmm. I was T3, and I did it better than everybody else. <laughs> but I think that was after the band test. So let me get to that. So then, you know, years go by, I'm not really, the, or a year or so goes by, and we have the infamous band test, which uh, Mr. R here gives uh, to all, gave to all of the students, and we had a, a lesson book, Essential Elements, book one, and which uh, is still in publication today. Yeah, Essential Elements it's for it's Bands. A great book. Mm -hmm. It's a great book, and. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. R would just give everybody in the band a a test uh, of just that book, and it was you know things like memorizing the exercise names or memorizing the composers who wrote certain exercises and blah and whatnot, and just general like essential elements trivia, and and also like band trivia, and just you know how to spell Rausenberger, you know <laughs> like right. some yeah. stuff like that, and so. Um, I did in preparation for, and this is how I, you know, study for everything. I do what I do best, and I wait to the last minute, and I s just memorize everything that's right in front of me, uh, ten minutes before the test. Great so, job. That makes me feel great. Yeah. Okay, go so on. So on the bus that morning, I sat with the Essential Elements book, and I read it. I like literally read it, not as a music book, but as a textbook. And sure enough, I got a 109. On, that's right, because I had all those extra credit points. Yes, that's right. you had extra credit points, and I killed it because I know how to spell. I can, <laughs> I can spell Timothy Rausenberger. Okay. Um, right. No problem. All right. And um, I got a 109, and from that day forth, uh, Mr. R, whether he was right or not, believed I was a uh, kind of a... a, a um, what is the word? What am I looking for? Prodigy? Yeah, prodigy. I wouldn't and, go that far. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my mom's sitting there laughing the whole time because, you know, he came up to my mom and said, hey, look, your, your son, he, he did really well on the band test. I, I want to do private lessons with him. I think he has a huge potential. And my mom goes to me, she goes, hey, like, you did well on the band test. And I was like, yeah, I memorized the whole book before the test. And my mom starts laughing because mm -hmm. here's his star thinks I'm like this next musical god. Mm -hmm. And I just memorized the book. And so that's how we started. And then I started taking private lessons. Now, to be fair, just I, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt you, sorry, but you know, to be fair, this is somebody who absolutely killed it on this test. <laughs> but when it came to his trumpet playing, to be fair, I mean, that was really a different story. And it's one of the main reasons I wanted to have him on today because, uh, you know, Kyle, for his first two years, to be fair, really was not uh, a great trumpet player by any means. Um, and the biggest issue, I think it's, it's uh, something for all educators to learn, uh, is to never give up on a student. I think that that's important. Um, sometimes it may need to be an instrument change. Uh, it may need some just some extra TLC, some patience. Uh, it could be a whole variety of different things. And sometimes you just have those situations where students just, um, they just overcome and persevere. And that's, Kyle is a testament to that. He is absolutely the poster child for, when it comes to people overcoming and persevering um, in, in, a, in adverse conditions. And, uh, you know, to be fair, I mean, and I, I think I told you this, but I, I don't know if I did, but the way that uh, Kyle's embouchure was, his, the, the, the structure of his Bad. lips and everything, uh, it was so poor, and the way that he was attempting just to play into a brass mouthpiece, he was far better equipped to be playing the euphonium. Far better equipped, especially with the fact that he had the three valves. And I have 
had that situation before where students have switched from trumpet to euphonium just for that reason. Uh, rarely the reverse. So uh, I, I know that in my initial lessons with them uh, after fifth grade, in the private lessons, that I had toyed with the possibility of, uh, of, of Kyle considering the euphonium instead of the trumpet which I knew was going to be a very, very hard sell because he loved playing the trumpet. So, I guess you can yeah. pick things up from so, there. So, I just, you know, Mr. R inspired me to work uh, every single day. Uh, I practiced for a half hour every day of my entire life uh, after that. And, you know, despite the embouchure errors, I worked through it. I still had terrible arm embouchure. I mean, it had gotten better and it, I improved it a little bit, but it was still bad. I was still playing the trumpet wrong. And, I mean, technically wrong. But I worked through it. I mean, I don't know why, how I did it, whether it was my airflow or just my lip strength, but I was able to start hitting high notes after practicing them long enough with the wrong embouchure. And, you know, I remember just sitting there like, I remember I was in, and when, it was really bad, when I was really bad at trumpet, it was like fifth grade, and I was trying to play uh, Hatikva. And the Hatikva had that high D in it. Yeah, the yep. Hatikva had high uh, And Hatikva was important to you because... Yeah, because I'm Jewish. And <laughs> well, that, Jesus, I Jewish, love the song. He loves great. that song. He's got, he's got to get Hatikva yeah, yeah. down. It's important for the family. I couldn't hit it. I would fuzz out on every time I tried to hit that D. And I remember I threw my trumpet on the ground. <laughs> and I was crying. And my mom and dad came up to me and I said, I quit. I can't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. Is stupid, uh, you know. I'm gonna do the sophisticated thing and play football. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I'm not laughing at that. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong. But if you can just picture the size of Kyle at that particular moment, yeah, uh, uh, four yeah. foot nothing, yeah. you know, uh, sixty pounds. Uh, I've been a great punter. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, but my dad was actually instrumental in me continuing to play trumpet because he said, look, you know, you'll never quit. You're not going to quit. Yeah, you're you're going to do, you're going to finish out the year. It was like halfway through the year. He goes, you're going to finish out the year. If you want to stop at the end of the year, that's fine. But you're not going to quit halfway through. And, you know, all it took was that little kick in my ass and I got it the next day. I practiced and I, I got it and I started getting it consistently. And that's really when it, and I continued trumpet after that, and all I worked my way under Mr. R's direction all the way up to uh, something, the impossible, which I never thought was possible. I got first chair in the senior uh, region wind ensemble, not even the symphonic band, like the step above. I was then argue like, according to the scores and who was in the band, uh, el eligible for the band, I was the number one trumpet player in region one yeah and, and 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 you know i was so i'll never forget that day getting those results because all that i went through my mind was um really the, all the hell you had to go through to get to that point and all the hard work on um, the solo incident i believe that was the concert etude wasn't it it was the concert etude i love that solo so much i practiced it every day and, and, and that's what got me up to the the that's what did it and 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 you know the thing was that he was he was so infatuated with that that solo played it so exceptionally well and was so well prepared but you know the thing and, and i'm going to be doing future podcasts on this but you know, there's there's a process that's involved. There's a process that's involved in anything. And I knew if Kyle was going to be able to succeed. And, and, and the, the plan, you have to understand, my friends, that, that the plan n was never, ever trying to get Kyle into uh, honor ensembles. I mean, that's always icing on the cake for any of my students. But to have a student come so far... And I, I mean, the, the worst really was I knew what he needed to do, the exercise he needed to do. He needed to do Rubank exercises. And I, I remember putting that book on his stand 
And I mean, I hated this. It's it's as it's as dry as it gets. It I mean, was terrible. It, it was it, because it, the the, the at most of the exercises have no names. It's just it's very very bland, but it's all technical. It's it's so technical and it's so necessary and and the mistake and I, and I, I I say this to anybody out there, especially. Uh, it really doesn't matter what instrument you're, you're teaching students. If you want students to be able to gain technical skills, they've got to do the Rubank book. They have to. I, I see t trumpet teachers constantly. They're jumping right into the Arbin book. That's a massive mistake. And 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 I know of um, and a lot of people. And I've had some uh, colleagues even say, uh, you know, a student will be very very advanced. So they put them into the Rubank advanced book. No, actually the book we did together was the elementary book yeah. it was it actually and you you have to explain to the student no you're not in fourth grade again you're in sixth grade and we need to do this book and that elementary book i don't know how kids because that was the method book that people used for the longest time i mean there there were all, all these amazing books that are out there now the Rubank Elementary, my God, the, some of the things in the back of that book are very, very difficult for a middle school student. Yeah, and, and um, we did it. We did the whole book. We did it. I mean, and and I'm and I ripped the cover off. Right, you ripped we the done. cover off. <laughs> <laughs> I threw it on the ground. Threw it on the ground. But you know, he earned it. He could have burned the book if he wanted to. Yeah, um, I still have it though. Yeah, you know what? It, it was it was so great that he did that that he um, that he worked so hard worked through that book and it paid off in in spades because of what he was able to accomplish uh in high school and now somebody who had loved the trumpet so much could actually play the trumpet and yeah. uh really became a, a great leader can you so you have this amazing musical experience um I don't know had you decided to pursue music how that could have worked out when which is not something you ever had on the agenda but what was fascinating was along the way and I didn't know this right away about you I didn't know this for a long time actually about what your real passion was really truly what your your passion was and then I really understood by the time you were in high school so if you can kind of share with listeners how it started for you in middle school what your true passion was and and um, you know, take us maybe a little closer to, you know, current day. Yeah, well, um, when I was in uh, uh, fourth, uh, yeah, fifth grade, when I was in fifth grade, I, uh, my friend got a video camera, and uh, at that point, like, YouTube had just, like, it was like, YouTube was like three years old, or like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so like, it was just getting started, and... Um, we, you know, watched a lot of YouTubers and YouTube stuff, and all we wanted to do was just get, like, famous. We just want to get famous. Now, keep in mind, this is back when YouTube had five-star ratings. Um, wow, wow. Yeah, you had a YouTube partner program, which doesn't exist anymore because everyone is technically a partner now because YouTube realized that if they put ads on everyone's videos, then they can just maximize the amount of money that they get. Oh, okay. Um, but back then, like, in order to customize what your your like YouTube profile, your channel looked like, you had to be a part of their partner program and get paid for your videos. And you could hmm. get like a banner. And so all we wanted was like a banner because it was like it was a status. It was a show. Uh, you know, nowadays a verified symbol is like essentially what that banner was to us. Like being verified, being important, and we just wanted to be YouTube famous. Um, so this was like what age? This, this was fifth grade. So we used to just make wow. constantly just Goodness. write and create and just make sketches in our basements. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, terrible. But <laughs> they, but that's but I got my start in front of the camera. Like I, I really liked acting. That's what I wanted to do. And this was just only one other person. Uh, two other people. Two, really okay. two other right. people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we just the three of us would just make stuff all the time. And mm -hmm. then um, when I got into seventh grade. Uh, I watched a movie. It's called the the Truman Show uh, with Jim yep. Carrey. Sure. Uh, about sure. you know, it's about a guy whose whole life is 
a reality TV show, a 24-7 reality TV show. And in the movie, there's the director of the TV show, the character, uh, who is the director of the TV show. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a seventh grader, I saw this director character literally control every aspect of this dude's life. Hmm. And I was like, wow, that's, that looks pretty awesome. So then I thought about becoming a director. I did end up learning that that's not what a director does. Um, mm -hmm. But I still fell in love with it. And that year, I, I, I wrote and made my first attempt at a short film. And what was the the first film? That it you did? was a, based on a video game called Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, and it was essentially just like a, um, like it was a lawyer. He, you you were, you were, you played as a lawyer, and it was like very story based. It was all about like choosing the correct answer to get you know to interrogate people and figure out who the real. It's a mystery game, and so the cases were very scripted. Everything was very scripted. So I literally just stole one of the cases from the game and just like tried to make it recreate okay. it. Uh -huh. It's my first attempt and it, it didn't work. It ended up failing, but uh, I still have the prop. Eh, um, I forget what the, the judge's hammer is called, but the gavel. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I still have my prop mm -hmm. gavel to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, that, it was my first prop I ever bought for something. Wow, and it was okay. like, I bought it off Amazon. Uh, yeah, this is before Prime. Like, we waited like three weeks for this, you know, this gavel. Uh, and I remember I had to ask my friend to buy it for me because I didn't, I was afraid to ask my mom or dad for the credit card. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't want to justify it. So I just like asked my friend who always is allowed to just buy whatever he wants. Oh, okay. And just like, I would pay him back. Taking cash, advantage, you know? right? Yeah, so I did. So that whole thing. But yeah, I made that. And then, you know, that just spiraled from there. I started writing and directing like all my, and making like just little sketches here and there skits still wanted to be YouTube famous. But then eventually I started to get more and more serious and I started to want to make films like literal films. And mm -hmm. that's what got me into filmmaking. And you know, around that same time in seventh grade, that's also when I decided I wanted to go to NYU to study it, to, to go there. That's when I decided I wanted to major in film at Tisch. And so everything I did from that point, whether it was the trumpet, whether it was like the plays I did or any of the activities I did, my grades, it was all in order to get to NYU. And then once I got there, you know, now I don't have a goal. I don't have a life goal. There's just nothing. I, I've completed everything. I can stop. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I know no. you too well. I don't know. I think that's the case. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no. But I, that, I, that was kind of a wake up call because then I realized that as I was getting closer, I was like, well, once I get in, like, what do I? What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Uh -huh. Like, what's my next thing? So I, I, you know, now I'm at a point where I'm, you know, writing and directing. Uh, that's what I like to do. I just directed a full-on like. And that's full that, crew. that's now. This is now. Yeah, this is now. Okay. Now I'm, I'm I just directed this past year a uh, my first ever like kind of like full crew, uh, budgeted short film. Oh, congratulations! Yes, that's great. Thank you. That's great. Um, and we fundraised the money back in in. Uh, around the holidays and or, I mean we fundraised back, uh, money um, and we uh, and you know it's just great now it's in post-production and you know we had we made it for a decent amount more than I had ever made you spent on a movie in my entire life mm -hmm. uh, I mean just to put in perspective we spent two hundred seventy dollars on uber uh, for equipment shipping just on uber yeah, alone just on ubers alone yeah oh my goodness uh, wow. so i mean i mean it's it's crazy and you know what it really taught me is that when you have a budget for something and let's like you just have money it, you can make a lot of problems go away very easily just by throwing money at it it really taught me that because you know i had a budget and every time like one of my producers came in and was like hey there's uh something you know we gotta we have to fix there's like a prop we need or i need food i was just like you know what here's my card it's fine. Um, just, just go with it. And it worked. And it made me realize how, like how easy it must be for people with money. My God, like you can solve a lot of issues with just throwing money at it, like giving someone a credit card. Um, but other than that, like the, the film I think is going to be successful. It's in post-production right now. Worked uh, very hard on it. Had a crew of 15, uh, really great people. Um, very, very talented people. I mean, my cinematographer, uh, was, has been recognized by the Emmy, like the, I forget who the company that runs the Emmys, but he is an Emmy, a student Emmy award winner. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So I worked with like the top, like top notch people. Um, and you know, I'm very excited. I plan on shipping this around to, uh, film festivals far and wide, anywhere from, you know, like Montclair film festival or like, you know, to, 
uh, Sundance. Like, I want to go, mm -hmm. that'd be a dream to get into Sundance with my first ever short film. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but I might as well try because what if it does? You know, it's a, got to take all these, you got to take the hit, you got to take the shot. So, um, you know, I plan on doing all that once it's done. And uh, from that point on, I now have an internship at okay. a small uh, production company in uh, New York City in Midtown, right up in Times Square. Uh, I work for them, paid, uh, 22 and a half hours a week this semester. I'm very excited to start. Uh, and, you know, I hope to use that as a launching pad as well. Does, so you're getting paid for this internship, which is great. Yeah. And I know that a lot of students when they're in college, I mean, I know that when I was in college, um, you know, I was a music major and I did work study mm -hmm. at my school and uh, I, I had to work in the music office. And uh, that was, um, I think we, we call that the uh, default position because uh, <laughs> I, I know, I know I never shared this with you, but uh, the secretary in the music building was the most difficult person to get along with. Wow. Impossible to to please, impossible mm -hmm. uh, to, to get her to laugh. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that she came straight from a convent, <laughs> straight into this secretarial position. But I can tell you something, I have met few people more passionate and with a bigger heart. And the thing I learned from her was, uh, if you, when you do something, you gotta do it right. Yeah. And that was something I learned and it was instilled in me, even though the pay was, I mean, it was dreadful. I mean, we're, we're talking, we, we were paid, I was in college, minimum wage, which was, I believe it was $4 an hour. It, right. And I mean, I worked hard. I worked yeah. very hard in that music office and, and enjoyed it. But in, a, in addition to that, and b believe me, there was not very little in that music office I was doing that had anything to do with music. It was, I, I was filing papers making yeah. copies removing staples oh i hated well, that yeah i mean i worked uh my whole you know time in college here i've worked three work study jobs mm -hmm. i worked four at one point i i work uh i had to drop some because i couldn't fit them into my schedule because of the internship but i worked in the digital media library which i had to do tech help t like uh, i was like te essentially tech support for all the classrooms okay and uh that was you know I used to do that 10 hours a week, and then uh, I work, I've work. i been working in the budget office, and I still do. Uh, I work as an administrative assistant in the budget office of, uh, you know, film, mm -hmm. and I do all the student hires. I do, you know, I do all the filing, all the tracking, all the payment stuff. Like, it's, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily do actual payment stuff, but, like, mm -hmm. I handle, like, the organization of all that. And, you know, it's a lot of office work, nothing to do with film. Um, but, you know, and then I also am a tour guide for uh, film. And so, you know, despite, you know, and, and why did I do all this? A, because I wanted the money. Right. And, but, but B, because I, through my budget office job, I was able to get all these other jobs because the budget office job got me in touch with all the administrators, like all the administrators. Wow. And I'm, I'm like buddy, buddy, like friends and, and, and you know, with all of the, the heads of every department, the dean of, you know, of film, like everybody, top people. And it's so because, it's because it, of this job because I work with them every day. I was always there. So it was ultimately because of the work study jobs. I mean, not necessarily all three of them yeah. or, you know, but that you were able to make so many connections, yeah. network and all that. Absolutely. And it's, it's pays off. You know, and it's, it's interesting because I, I know that, uh, just doing this job, which mm -hmm. was, it was really, again, just having to work with this particular secretary is so demanding being her assistant. But at the same time, though, I knew, I knew that some people at least saw me as being like a saint, uh, that I was able to get along with her as well. And I, and I always would say to people too, like you, you actually don't understand her. She's, uh, such a kind hearted, uh, amazing woman. And, um, and, and really, really was the heartbeat of that department. Yet, that was barely paying me anything. The thing that actually I was doing, and this was brutal, uh, it just goes to show, you know, whereas Kyle here has has this had this wonderful thing that's been able to give him connections, <laughs> my the job that I had throughout college helped me with my people skills, hands down. 
in terms of dealing in high stress environments and managements and managing people. Uh, but I worked in a hardware center. Uh, I worked there. Uh, it was a Home Depot clone, basically. It was uh, for anybody on the East Coast or more specifically in the New Jersey area. Uh, it was called Rickle Home Center. And Rickle was uh, around since I believe the 50s. And then it folded, jeez, uh, I, I, th I think it was, I know, I'm, I, I should know this right off the top of my head, but I, I want to say, I, I guess I was about 25 when I stopped working there. I want to say it was about 1998 or so, where I think it completely uh, shut its doors. <clears throat> but I worked there for 10, over, a little over 10 years, and I served in just about every possible capacity of the store short of actually being the store manager and i there's so much knowledge i gained but none of it was music and certainly none of it was networking but it paid me well i mean back then to be getting uh pay where i was getting 12 13 dollars an hour wow. nobody was getting that type of money you, crazy. Were, you you were if you were getting a job that was being paid you know seven or eight an hour you were doing well uh, and to be able to get that much money. So I would have to come home from Pennsylvania every weekend. And I had to factor in my gas and everything. But I was able to pull in per weekend probably about $200, which is huge. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot. A lot of money back I mean, then. You're getting paid what I'm getting paid now for the internship. It's $12. Right. Yeah. It's so, like, and that's a lot nowadays. Yeah. So. Right, right. It's still a lot. You know? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, and that was and that was back then. And, yeah, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you. You know, it it it's really taught me money management and everything. Mm -hmm. So here's the big question I have for you now. Yeah. Is it just that you do the internships or do you have anything else? I mean, my goodness, you're going to NYU. Oh. I, I have a very hard time believing you have a free ride. If I remember correctly, no, you don't I have don't. a free ride. I don't. And uh, so... They don't give scholarships. Okay. All right. So how do you subsidize? I mean, do you have other ways? I mean, are you having to wait tables? I know that's what a lot of people do well, in the city. So what uh, do you do? Luckily, and actually through an old teacher at my, at high, in high school, I met a, uh, a wedding photographer who, oh, who, wow. who, okay. was, who was making a short film and he was looking for someone to help him. And you know, this was a couple, this was last summer, or it was July of 2016, and the teacher saw the post on Instagram, and she shared it with me, and she said, hey, get in contact, he was like you in high school. Oh, and, my. And so I emailed him, and he gave me the job, and it was more money than I'd ever expected to ever be paid. It hmm. was the, he paid me $250 for a day and I worked two days for him and that was the most amount of money I've ever made in two days in my life That's, to that point. I'm, I'd be fine with that myself yeah, right was, now. I mean, I I'll mean, take 250 for yeah, the day. I know. I mean, sure. 12 hour days. It was mm -hmm. hard. It was film work and I knew what I was getting into. But at that point I was still working for free for film sets because that's what we did. Mm -hmm. It was just to get experience. Right. And so I was like, wow, this is great. And so, and, and then he, I remember he called me up and he goes, Hey, uh, I'm also a wedding photographer and I need like an assistant. Could you help me out? And I said, would you be interested in working? And then I said, yeah, sure. And so I started to assist him be his assistant at weddings. And since then I grew, I like worked, he, he gave me a camera one day. He said, Hey, just take some shots. Do you want to play with this camera? Do you want to like take some video? And I said, yeah, sure. And so I did, he really liked what I, I, I was doing. So then he hired, started hiring me as a videographer. I got a raise. Like every time I do video, I mean, mm. I still work as an assistant. It's freelance, mm -hmm. but you know, it's consistent for the most part and you know when i work assistant i get an assistant's pay but then when i work videography i get videographer pay mm -hmm. and now since that point i'm now also editing for him i make i edit i do his big long you know three hour edits of the whole wedding and that is a whole other you know pay and so like i i, <laughs> I work a lot <laughs> i mean yeah you know so like i do work a lot and um I think it's because I just, I feel, I feel like guilty for not making money when I can, like when I'm given the opportunity. Uh, well, but you know what though, here's the thing. And this is, yeah. and th th you know, this is one of the reasons why Kyle is my first interview and, and, uh, all, all the reasons I'm so proud of him is because uh, when I think of all of the students I've ever taught in my entire career, which is really like five figures worth of students, uh, 
he's absolutely at, near the very top of the list, at least if not the top of the list. Really, be, again, because I talk about the perseverance, but you know, this is someone who uh, does not let any opportunity pass by. I mean, I, I'm I don't get to talk to we don't we don't get to talk enough, and trying to get together for this interview has been very very challenging because of our schedules, and we're we're both so darn busy. But you know, when I know a student is not able to respond very quickly to me, it is usually because they're insanely, insanely busy and they have a lot going on. Uh, and that's often been the case with Kyle. And, and, but you know what though, I have to even go one step further. And this is one of the reasons he does remain at the top of the list. And, and it's something to share with students, with educators, I think with honestly, everyone. And that is, uh, there was a point where uh, there, were, there were a lot of things that I've done for Kyle over the course of his, uh, his life uh, in terms of reference letters, uh, in terms of, you know, making connections with, with other people, in terms of uh, even some of the friends that he has now, uh, and people that he, that he met through the mu music department and, and, and so on and so forth. And... You know, there was a point where I very simply actually needed something in return. I actually needed uh, a, a, a statement, essentially, from uh, someone I had worked with or taught in the past. And I reached out to a whole bunch of people. And I just kind of put it in on SOS and said, you know, I need, you need you to help me out with this. And to know, and you listen to everything that Kyle's so busy with. To know that instantaneously, I think it was in less than an hour, he dropped everything that he had going on and he did it. And and I I can't even put into words how grateful I am to you for the fact that you, you did that just because I know how busy you were. And I also understand what it's like to be busy and I, I'm wired the same way where when my students ask me to do things for them, I drop everything and I do it as quickly as I possibly can for them. If I can't do it on the spot, um, it's usually within 24 hours. Uh, but I think it just is, it's, it's a lesson to everyone that it really is inexcusable for people to not communicate in a timely manner. And I've had podcasts on this before and I really, quite honestly, I don't have a heck of a lot of use for people that take insane amounts of time to get back to me. I just don't because I view it as such an incredible disrespect uh, because if anybody knows me and certainly anybody that knows Kyle, we're the type of people that we just, for people that are important, we drop everything when the, the, the time comes. Um, and, and, you know, something needs to be done. So, you know, just to kind of wrap it up, and this has been, it, it's, you, you know, you say it's an honor. It's an honor for me to have you on here. Um, and it's been such a privilege to be able to know you. But uh, the one thing just in closing that I, I just want you to be able to share is what is the end game? You know, you went into college, you're like, okay, now what am I going to do? So what is it that you ultimately want to do now with, your life. I mean, do, do you see something five years, 10 years from now, well, any particular goals? Yeah. Well, I mean, my main, my, in terms of like my film goals, I would like, I, I am planning to be the youngest best director Oscar winner ever. And Damien Chazelle won that award last year and beat the record. And I think he was 32 in four months or something. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it by 31. So I want to do it when I'm 31. I want to, you know, really break the record. Um, but you know what? Honestly, like, that is, a that is like, my film goal. And I, I always say this. I get most of my happiness, uh, you know, from my personal relationships with people mm -hmm. and from, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So even if I, I – in my mind, I'm working towards getting that Oscar. Yeah, but yeah. But I know for a fact that as long as I have a really strong – support group around me of friends family um you know any, so, any kind of yeah. romantic relationship like mm -hmm. that is really where my bread and butter is yeah and that's yeah. truly where my 
all like most of my happiness comes and I know that as long as I am am comfortable and have a strong support system around me um, one full of love and caring I, I know that I'll be happy no matter what but the end game is to direct some killer movies that make uh, a lot of people happy and a lot or at least a lot of people entertained because mm -hmm. ultimately I just like entertaining people I've always been an entertainer whether it was through plays through making YouTube videos through you know you know learning a new skill just to show people whether like that was Rubik's cubes or you know oh, yeah, I, learned, I taught Rubik's myself piano my just so I could play yeah. for people I taught myself magic so I could pl like, do magic for people like whatever it was you know, I'm now teaching myself bass for no other reason than for my own mm -hmm. need to be able to say that, oh, look, I can play bass because I've, I've always wanted to be in a rock band. So, like, why not? You know, uh, that's that's a work in progress. But, you know, like whether it's, you know, I, I'm always just trying to entertain somebody and make people forget about the world for a few seconds especially now because i think that's really important well I, and, I, and i boy i couldn't agree with you more with that my goodness with this this the, the climate of our world and and as i say in all my podcasts i i am hell-bent and determined to not be bringing anybody down and talking about everything that's going on and making absolutely no reference to our current administration i just won't do it yeah uh, but at the same time uh I, I am of the same mindset. I, I positivity is important. I, a positivity is important, and and uh, especially in the world of music, uh, for you know, it's your uh, medium is film and yeah. and movie, and for me it's music, and we're both so similar in that way that we just want to be able to take the person out of this, whatever this is that we're all going through right now, and be able to have them enjoy this i remember you telling me once you know about the the, the beauty of the film i think there was a quote that you had said yeah of something it's you admired. uh it's from frank capra who was a film director great film director from okay, the 30s uh -huh. and that's right that's right yeah and I, i'm gonna paraphrase but uh he said uh, the essential like quote was there's been no great power like there's been no great world leader I mean, he says, like, it's kind of outdated, but he says, like, Sultan or Pope. Like, he says there's no world leader that has the power that a filmmaker has. And that's the power to talk to millions of people for two hours in the dark. Wow. I mean, think about it. Nobody else yeah. can do that. And fun fact, I put that as my senior quote in the yearbook in high school and people thought it was sexual so people were <laughs> so people were laughing and i go wait no that was really just a quote from this director like uh -huh. i didn't mean it like that because i said uh i just want to enter because i mean granted i paraphrased it i said i wanted to entertain millions of people for two hours in the dark and i think people were like oh my gosh kyle i was like what they're like you got it through the sensors i was like oh okay um but yeah it was really you know it's really innocent it's just that you know really at one other point, do you sit for in the dark and stare like mm -hmm. for two hours? Except at a TV show or at any a movie or, you know, it's very. I mean, can you even sit in the dark and talk to your friends for two hours? No, I can't and, even and, talk and, to people for two hours. And you know what? And and it's funny because I've had uh, I've had the same thing, uh, with music, and I've said this in, in past podcasts that. I've always stood stood very uh, had a very hard line on this that concerts should never ever go beyond two hours. I don't care how great the music is; it just doesn't matter. Yeah. The second you go past that threshold, once you go past two hours, even the greatest ensembles in the world, it can be very very difficult to uh, to maintain uh, the the focus and. Uh, the the devotion and especially if you're really passionate about music uh it can be it's a grind it's it's a lot to be able to listen uh and and be able to in, relax and enjoy but also take in what the artists on the stage are presenting to you and how they're interpreting the music from the the, the composer uh or or whatever the case may be if we go one step further into um anything having to do with the arts but anything that goes over two hours and uh i i 
completely understand the need to kind of transport people. Uh, I'm the same way, you know, and when I'm in school with my rehearsals with my students, to just be able to kind of take them away for wh however long it is, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever.